Hello, my name is Ewan Russell Jones, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this conversation about a new book by Professor Philip Jenkins called Fertility and Faith, The Demographic Revolution and the Transformation of World Religions, published by Baylor University Press. And it's great to welcome its author, Philip Jenkins, who I'm delighted to say is a fellow Welshman. Dr. Jenkins was born not many miles away from where I'm sitting at the moment in Port Talbot in South Wales, a great steel town. But he spent most of his career in the United States, and he's now the Distinguished Professor of History and Co-Director of the Programme on Historical Studies of Religion at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Professor Jenkins' books cover a wide range of topics, from criminal justice to the clergy sex abuse scandals of recent decades. But his main focus is the study of global Christianity, past and present, and of new and emerging religious movements. He's been tracking the fortunes of religion in the modern world for many years, and now he's published this fascinating book, which explores the relationship between fertility rates and major social changes that are taking place right across the globe and especially changes in patterns of religious faith and practice. If you're tempted to think that this is just some statistical issue for sociologists and pointy heads, then think again. Philip Jenkins argues strongly that this is a key factor for understanding some of the major religious and political developments in the world today, including perhaps even the US presidential elections, whose outcome still seems to be in question. If you're watching this event live, you're very welcome to put your own questions to Philip. You can email them to questions at regent-college.edu. I think the uh, address is on the screen. And we'll try to address them as the conversation unfolds. But let's, 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 let's start, Philip. Koiso, as we say in Wales. Many thanks for joining us today. Perhaps you could begin at the beginning uh, by helping us understand why people who are interested in religious belief in theology need to bother themselves with demographics. What on earth does fertility have to do with faith? Well, uh, and uh, we measure uh, the change in a society through uh, fertility, the number of uh, children that a woman will have during her uh, lifetime. You can have high rates or low rates, and the usual number is uh, 2.1. Uh, if she has 2.1 children in, uh, in her life, then that's a stable rate, much higher, 5 or 6, uh, that's a high rate, and so on. There is a close correlation between a fertility rate of a particular society or nation and the level of religious involvement or participation in that society. Now note, I just said correlation. I just said the two are linked. At that point, I didn't say how they're linked. But one of the most important changes in the world in recent years has been a collapse infertility rates around most of the world, first in Europe, then spreading further afield. And that correlates very, very closely with a drift towards secularization. I think we can use these fertility changes to analyze and predict where secularization is going. Just to oversimplify, if you show me details about a country and you show me their fertility rate, I will have a pretty good idea as to how strong institutions of religion are in that country, and also probably whether that country legalizes same-sex marriage, what its attitudes to religion are. And that sounds like a wide claim, but I think I can defend it. So that, that's, that's mm. a very quick response. Yeah, so for you, there's an equation between high fertility rates, countries, countries are having lots of babies and high practice of religion. And similarly, low fertility countries, there's a, there's a, a correlation there with low faith as well. What, what are the, some of the reasons, I mean, you say there's no causality here. It's not a causation, right? One thing is not necessarily causing the other one. What, what, what is the link, do you think? I'm saying that 
uh, then there might well be complex uh, patterns of causation, but it's not a very simple one-to-one uh, -one thing. Just to give you an example, uh, in the 1960s, people looked at countries like Denmark and saw that their fertility rate was moving down to 1.6, 1.5, very, very low historically. And at the same time, the country was becoming much more secular. Uh, an African country like uh, Uganda, for example, might have a fertility rate of five or six, uh, very, very high religion. And you first look at that and you think, well, gee, that's interesting, but uh, you know, who cares? And then you notice that it holds true for dozens of countries, for hundreds of countries. And in fact, there's only a couple of countries that run against that trend. So there's, there's the correlation. What's the causation? I can suggest a couple of things and they go both ways. You might argue, for example, that as you take children out of the picture, there are far fewer links connecting families and people to institutions. You're no longer sending people to first communion classes, bar mitzvah classes. Uh, you begin to think, why should we be involved with that uh, church, that synagogue, if it's just the two of us? Take children out of the religious picture and see what happens. You could argue it's the other way. People become more secular. They lose that commitment to fulfill the command to go and multiply. They, uh, they, they forgo that kind of idea. I don't know exactly which way the causation goes. And one problem is that the changes happen in such a close period. In a country like Italy, for example, the collapse in fertility and the real move towards the secularization happened over a period of about 10 years. It's very, very hard to see what causes what. So what I'm saying initially is, it is a, it's an observation. Let's explore some of the, uh, some of the implications and what can we predict from that? There's, um, I mean, you say at one point that low fertility societies may not just be inhospitable to religion and they may actually be quite hostile what what what, what what's going on there do you think i mean why would the like you could one can see how it may not be that you know you need to send your kids to sunday school or whatever so there's a, there's a kind of loss of appeal there but what why why might it become inhospitable or even hostile right I want to be very careful here. Uh, I'm not talking about kind of religion in general. And it's quite possible that people in a society like that could personally have quite strong spiritual ideas or religious ideas. But the key thing is institutions. Once you separate the idea of family off, once you separate sexuality and reproduction, people become a lot less willing to have churches or religious institutions tell them what to do uh, with their personal lives. And you'll often get political campaigns, which might involve, for instance, a referendum or a political struggle over uh, key moral issues like what initially contraception, abortion, same-sex marriage, assisted suicide, where uh, churches push very hard for conservative moral uh, positions. And all these people who have become detached from those institutions are much more willing to push back uh, against them. So a low fertility society is politically in, uh, inhospitable and uh, is quite likely to, uh, often to believe the worst uh, charges that go around about those institutions. And you see this in many um, European countries, uh, uh, first of all, but also further afield. We'll explore that uh, a, a little bit more in a moment, but um, it's not so long ago, is it? In fact, you know, it's just a matter of a few decades, actually, that um, there were regular stories in the press um, about a, a kind of panic about a global population explosion, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that this was a kind of um, phenomenon that was going to happen everywhere. Uh, and what are we going to do about it? But I mean, what you're saying is that this is not only not happened. In fact, the opposite is happening in many, many places. You've got, you know, the, 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 the reality of, of seriously reduced population in many parts of the world. That is one of the biggest changes of 
consciousness that has happened in my lifetime. Around about 1970, everybody knew uh, that there was a population explosion, that there were going to be all these billions of people on, uh, on the earth in the, um, in the middle of the uh, coming century. To put it crudely, we have lost 2 billion people since then in terms of what was projected versus what we've actually got. Because so many people in Latin America and Asia gave up having those traditional, quote, third world uh, population growth rates and suddenly became Danish. And so population rates that we used to think of as Scandinavian have spread around the world. Um, India, for example, half the states of India now have sub replacement fertility rates. Many countries in Latin America and Asia now have Scandinavian uh, fertility rates. The original projections for 2050, the world was um, going to have 11 billion people. It's more probably going to be 9 billion people. We've lost 2 billion people, which is clumsy. Um, that change in fertility rates is absolutely historic. And what people are now concerned about is population contraction. And planners around the world are now looking at that in the context of military dimensions, commercial, economic, trade, and what I'm trying to argue, religion. Some of the statistics that you, you give on this are, are just mind boggling, uh, you know, particularly places like South Korea, for example, that you, you say got, went from a, an extremely high um, mm. uh, rate, fertility rate, um, just a matter of decades ago, and is now at way lower than replacement level. But then there's somewhere like Iran. That, again, there was a panic about Iran, wasn't there, because of, of the, the kind of um, Islamic revolution, particularly in the, the possibilities for, for export that were gonna, gonna happen through this population explosion as well. And, and that is, is, is not only not materialized, it's actually, it too is facing serious population reduction. Uh, back in the 1980s, a typical Iranian woman had seven children in her lifetime. Right now, it's around 1.6, 1.5. It's about the same level as Canada. Uh, it is way below uh, replacement. And, you know, somebody might ask, well, uh, so that makes nonsense of the idea of um, fertility and religion, because surely Iran is a wildly religious country. Well, the Iranians don't think so. Uh, not long ago, the head of the, Iran uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard complained and said, look, we have 60,000 mosques in our country, only 3,000 of them actually work. Our country is becoming very secular. And there are surveys of what Iranians actually think. And they are, a lot of them are what you might call spiritual, but not religious. And a lot of others are atheists. Um, so mainline orthodox Islam that you have in that country is very much a minority to suit. Once again, as the fertility rates collapse, uh, so the levels of organized institutional faith uh, collapse. And you just wonder, I wish our policymakers, when they look at a country like Iran, would start by looking at that basic fact. What is the fertility rate? It tells you a whole lot. So let's explore some of these, these factors that might contribute to this uh, decline in infertility. And for you, it's, it's very much connected with some sort of process of modernization, some kind of um, um, the, the way in which modernity has impacted upon uh, societies around the world. What, um, I mean, let's take one, for example, and that is, uh, I mean, a, a kind of very obvious one in a way, but the education of women. Why, why is that a, a significant factor? Right. So I, I want to be careful talking about modernity. So for instance, uh, in the 1950s, Europe, North America were very modern societies in, in a particular uh, way. And yet they had, you know, very high fertility rates. It's the baby boom. Um, but think what happens from the 60s uh, onwards, a number of things. Uh, contraception becomes much more easily available you get a much larger concentration of the economy in service, not industry. Service industries are much more likely to employ uh, women. Women become educated, they get professional uh, jobs. A professional educated woman, I'm not saying she can't have six or seven children, but it's difficult for her. She's much more likely to want 
two or, uh, or, or maybe uh, one or, or none. She may not want to uh, get married at all. So there is a fundamental change in, uh, in gender uh, going on as part of that. With the gender change, there's a shift in concepts of family and also the relationship of that family, of those individuals uh, to religious um, institutions. Um, and also think about it, you know, 100 years ago, the, uh, the local parish priest, the pastor, was likely to be the most educated man, or was a man, in that particular community. Uh, no longer uh, likely to be true, uh, because uh, the amount of education that lay people have uh, has grown so much, so many people have gone through uh, higher education. There are so many things uh, going on. And the, the other change is a medical change in a, a fundamental difference in the concept of, um, of death. Uh, we are far less likely to see death as something around us. People go off and die in hospitals. Uh, we're far less likely to have large numbers of relatives who will, uh, who will die. We do not see death. We do not think about uh, death. You take death out of the equation, so much of what religious professionals do and did has been connected with responding to death. As lives get longer, you don't take death out of the equation, but it plays a much smaller role. So there's a whole series of things go, going on. It, it's, a, it's a complex set of processes. Yeah. Just to go back to that uh, that that uh, issue about women's education, women, you know, the kind of um, op professionalization, the, the op employment opportunities for women and so on, that seems to be such a significant factor in all this. Does that explain to a degree why, um, I mean, obviously the Taliban targeted this, didn't they? The Taliban, for the Taliban, you know, actually um, targeting women's education and, and all of that was a major defense as far as they can see, could see of a kind of their un understanding of a religious society. But does that help to explain some of the kind of pushback against women's employment, women's opportunities in other parts of the world, even in the West? I, I think that's absolutely central. By the way, if you look at the countries uh, in the world with the highest um, fertility rates, you do a pretty good map of the main centers of extreme Islamism, including countries like Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. Uh, when the Islamic State was talking about leaving Iraq, they were talking about being kicked out. They named three countries as the countries they were going to set up new headquarters, and they were the three African countries with the highest fertility rates in uh, uh, countries like Mali and uh, Burkina Faso. Um, there is a strong correlation between extremely high fertility, uh, extremely high social disorder and unrest, and an openness to religious extremism and fanaticism. And if you are a woman, caught in that situation, I, I choose my words advisedly, heaven help you. It's an extremely difficult and dangerous setting. Mm. You mentioned the, um, uh, the issue of, uh, of our familiarity with death and, um, um, you know, the sense of, of mortality, uh, which you link in the book to this sense of what you call existential security. You know, what makes us what makes us safe and in um, in pre-modern societies I suppose it, it very much is or, or you know where technology isn't present kind of high quality medicine isn't present it tends to be sought for in miracle in um, healing mm -hmm. um, on a in a kind of directly supernatural way um, so in fact, there's a really fantastic quote um, uh, where you talk about maybe the, the things that we need to worry about as far as kind of religious belief is concerned is not, not or think about, not, is not so much the consequences of Marx and Darwin and Freud, but what, you know, what comes out of the work of Louis Pasteur and the, the invention of antibiotics and all of that, um, you know, one naturally then doesn't look to the divine or to the transcendent for, for answers in that area. Um, 
I mean, is there any way around that? Do you, I mean, you know, for a kind of a society, do you think um, uh, one of my colleagues at, uh, at Regent talks, uh, Craig Gay talks about the way in which we've all become practical atheists in the modern world, um, you know, because of this kind of dynamic at, at work, uh, we don't naturally think of the solution as being a spiritual one. Uh, is that the way in which you're thinking here that modernity um, kind of works against the the uh, the significance of religion? I'm saying that modernity changes the balance um, and religious institutions have to be very, very careful to uh, to take account of, of their markets, of, uh, of their audiences. So um, in a country with uh, very high uh, levels of uh, medicine, for example, like Germany or Canada or whatever, um, simplistic healing messages are not going to fly. But there are many different kinds of healing, aren't there? It doesn't have to be healing of a broken leg. It can be healing of a mind, a soul, a spirit. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that many churches uh, have made in recent years is ceding so much of the realm of therapy uh, to secular professionals when it is such a large area of traditional religious message and religious content. Um, so um, what I'm saying is the fertility change that I'm talking about uh, changes so many assumptions. It is not in any sense a death warrant for religion. It's a death warrant for certain very limited concepts of religion. Institutions have to learn to change and adapt to that new world. That, that, uh, that fascinating. There's so much in, in that whole area that uh, kind of relates to, you know, our experiences of, of, of life. But uh, um, an issue that probably all of us face um, in certainly heavily in Europe, also in North American societies, is the issue of immigration, migration. And you link this again strongly to fertility rates. So yeah. can you explain a little bit about that, that link and why this matters then religiously. Let me give you just a, a, a number. The, uh, the median age of the European Union is about 42. The median age of the nation of Uganda, which is a very high fertility society, is about 15. If your society has a median age of 42, if it is a bunch of people in their 40s, if you have a very high proportion of people in their 60s, 70s and 80s, you're not going to have the people to do the basic work and to pay the taxes. You can only keep a low fertility society going by bringing in migrants from high fertility societies. That works wonderfully. Um, but those people from high fertility societies also bring in their own religious systems. Uh, and most famously, most controversially for many people, uh, the immigrants that they brought into continental Europe to do the jobs and pay the taxes tended to be Muslim. And so that meant uh, Islam became established or reestablished in Europe in a way that has you know, shocked and troubled many people. What we don't pay attention to is that the exact mirror image of that happened in Islamic countries like in the Arab Gulf, where you had low fertility societies, uh, they had to bring in immigrants and they brought in Christian immigrants. As a result, the Arab Gulf has gone from being almost entirely Muslim to being about 10% Christian. So fertility changes demand migration, Migration means bringing in new religions from other parts of the world. And so it means that societies become more hybrid, more diverse. And that is another thing that all religions uh, have to accommodate to. How do we deal with our new neighbors from these very different uh, uh, religions? So once again, tell me a fertility rate of a society and I'll tell you whether they are senders of migrants or receivers of migrants. And then this becomes um, a political, can become a, a, a political issue within countries um, that need migrants, that need immigration, um, but it can stoke up a huge amount of resentment. Um, and uh, so the, the outcomes are quite complex, aren't they? You know, on the, on the one hand, you're, you're kind of, 
in a sense, reinvesting the religious life of that country in some ways, but you're also potentially stoking up massive resentment. How does that, how does that equate? How does that work? You know, if, if, if the society's need. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying, partly it's, um, it's, it, there's almost a lack of realism. Um, people perhaps don't pay attention to the birth rate in the societies of where the, uh, where the young people are, where the people are doing the jobs. And uh, maybe they assume that uh, they can live in a society without young people and the jobs will be done by what? Robots? Uh, Japan is a country that is facing this issue terribly. Japan has an extremely low fertility rate, it's a fast aging rate. They desperately need people to do the jobs, but they refuse to accept immigration in any large numbers. Either they have to change or their country cannot survive as a functioning uh, society. Uh, other countries recognize that. You know, you, you asked this question about um, resentment. Um, if you look at some of the massacres and mass killings that have occurred, like the attack on a mosque in New Zealand and so on, you've had these dreadful crimes. Look at the notes that the killers have left and look how often recently they emphasize the birth rate. One of those killers began his note with, it's the birth rate, it's the birth rate, it's the birth rate. Um, so, so demographic fears become racial fears. They become religious fears. And what I'm suggesting is the first thing to do is let's have an intelligent understanding of what the demographic rates uh, are, what is uh, inevitable in kinds of change, and let's discuss how we can uh, absorb and take advantage of the, uh, the new situation. Mm. So the, the populist movements um, that we've seen, I mean, we've seen it in Britain with Brexit and, and nationalism and so on in, in the United States. There's a, there's a dimension of this where birth rates are playing directly into political tensions, political conflicts, political movements um, that are growing on the back of this, of people who are kind of willing to take, you know, to, to, to focus in on that as a kind of key issue. If you just take uh, Brexit, and I mean, we could talk about that at great length, um, the two best predictors for how somebody voted on Brexit were um, age and uh, education. Uh, it's, uh, it's a generational uh, issue. Those are the kind of uh, factors. And uh, so many people who voted for Brexit thought they could get rid of migration and immigration uh, through that. And you know, clearly such is, uh, such is not the case. Um, but again, uh, these fertility rates are, uh, are important. Also, also, what's interesting is they're not uniform in countries. A country may have an area with uh, a high fertility rate, an area with a low fertility rate, and you get all those sort of tensions within that country. And again, that helps understand how those countries uh, even debate, uh, debate issues. And I, uh, I talk uh, a lot about that, and that may be uh, way too much detail for what you, you want to cover here. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got to read the book, haven't we? You've got to you read go. the book. And, uh, you know, there's a, a wealth of stuff in there. It's, and it really is fascinating. You talk at one point, I think you're, you're quoting from a, another scholar who uses this phrase, um, the doom loop of modern liberalism. What do you, what do you mean by that? Um, yeah, and indeed, that is not my uh, phrase, though it's an interesting idea. So you have a society uh, where people are very uh, individualistic and atomized and uh, they, um, uh, they live for themselves and they don't have uh, children or they have very small families. Uh, you have a society then with a great deal of uh, immigration and the people you bring in tend to be very religious very uh, conservative, and maybe with not much time for the assumptions of that liberal um, society. Uh, so in that argument, which I don't necessarily um, uh, uh, accept, that kind of uh, liberalism uh, is almost like a, um, a, a self-destructive um, uh, phenomenon. And please understand, I'm not suggesting that, uh, you know, that kind of immigration need be uh, destructive, um, but in some cases, uh, you can have those uh, uh, those kind of um, those kind of conflicts. Um, but like I say, if you take young people out of a situation, which is what a low fertility rate means, how do you keep the society going 
And that means you have to find young people somewhere and you get them from high fertility, high faith societies. And they might be extremely fine people, but they're going to be different from what was there before. Great. So um, if I can remind uh, those who are watching this live that uh, if you've got a question for, for Philip um, based on what he said or uh, what you think he might be thinking, um, why don't you, um, you email it to um, questions at regent-college.edu and uh, we'll take a look at it. And I'm, I'm just checking now that uh, we haven't uh, got any questions coming in. Oh, we're, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, let me ask you about the United States. You're obviously living in the United States. You've lived there for a long time and, and you've got a, a special, obviously, interest in what's happening in the religious life of the states. As I think the whole world does in, in many ways, it, it's, uh, it's such a, a fascinating place. But many, in many ways, the US seems to be an anomaly, an outlier when it comes to issues of the relationship between secularization and and modern cultures um can you tell tell us why explain why that is um and then talk a little bit about the relation to this particular issue of um fertility rates right for many years basically right up until about oh a decade ago Many people wrote about the United States as being, as you say, uh, an anomaly. It's a very uh, kind of high, high religious uh, faith country and also quite a high fertility country um, uh, re relatively. Uh, the level of religious uh, involvement participation is um, extremely high by European or by uh, Canadian uh, standards and especially in certain uh, parts of the country. What I have observed is very interesting just in the last decade or so is the fertility rate started dropping and is presently in the United States below Danish levels. And at the same time, in that same decade, the United States has started developing some of the real major symptoms of European style secularization. And we see that in uh, lots of ways, but one of the best examples is, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of the nuns, that is N-O-N-E-S, -E those people who when they're- It's not the ones them, in the habit. Not that's the right. the nuns in the habit. We have to get out nuns, of, aren't they? We have to get out of that habit. These are people who, when they're asked what their religion is, they say, None. I have no religious affiliation. It doesn't mean they're atheists, but it means they're not connected to a religious institution. The proportion of nuns in the US has risen very dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years in exactly the same period that the fertility rate has dropped. And the three largest religious communities in the US right now are evangelicals, Catholics, and nuns. And within just a year or two, the nuns are going to be the largest of those three groups. That is a stunning change in a very short time. The United States is also very divided. It has high fertility rates, uh, states, low fertility states, and very, very predictably, you show me the fertility rate of a state and I'll show you how it voted in the last three elections. Um, high fertility, high faith states are red Republican, um, low fertility, low faith, with lots of nuns, uh, tend to be Democrat. And then there are states which are in the middle, which are the ones where all the court fights are in progress right now uh, because they're divided like 50, 50, 49, 51. So fertility is an extremely good uh, predictor of religious behavior and the political behavior that grows out of it, particularly in an age of culture wars. That is so interesting. I mean, let's let's spend a bit more time on that in a moment. But to go back to the central idea about America as an outlier, an anomaly. Um, I mean, the the idea was uh, has been, isn't it, that secularization is this kind of inevitable process mm -hmm. um, by you know the theorists um, who who say that you know well, well you know the more Kind of rational your society is the more scientific technological all of that stuff um the more that religion will kind of basically wither away 
and the United States seem to buck the trend of that and say, no, no, there's no inevitability about it at all. But, you know, what you're saying here is that there does seem to be much more of a kind of an inev inevitability about it, even almost a, a kind of determinism about it. Yeah. Um, I hate that D word, uh, determinism. <laughs> um, yeah. But there are some scholars I really respect, and what they argue is that, you know, yes, the secularization thesis does work, but that for various reasons that we can talk about, the United States has been on about a 40, 50 year delay mechanism, but that it is now moving quite rapidly in that uh, European uh, direction. And like I say, if you look at the fertility rates, it works absolutely uh, uh, beautifully. And what is interesting, if you then apply that to um, what we know from Europe, my concern is that the 2020s might well witness an extremely rapid process of secularization. You know, don't forget, when we look at Europe, it's important to remember that countries that in 1960 were some of the most religious countries in the world um, only took 10 or 20 years to secularize totally. The Netherlands was an extremely religious society in the 1940s and 1950s. You know, there were great uh, Catholic visions in Amsterdam. Uh, they were very faithful Calvinist uh, Protestants and so on. In the 1970s, by the 80s, they were mainly gone. And the Netherlands became one of the most secular societies in history. Is that the fate of the United States? I don't know. But I'm, um, I'm very concerned about that because the changes are proceeding so rapidly. And what concerns me is that the 2020 pandemic might accelerate that process. How, how do you think that could happen? What, would, what, what does the pandemic, right. what impetus does that give for this? Let me speak um, personally. Um, I spent long months when I could not attend my church. I could participate in activities uh, virtually and by Zoom. And I'm very grateful to the fellow members of my church who gave me that uh, opportunity. But electronic community is just not the same as face-to-face -face community. Where you lose those kind of direct human uh, links, where you lose the sense of being able to go to a place, a special place, what is the difference between me watching a church service on television and physically going to uh, participate with my friends around me to, to watch that uh, service? It's a different experience. I think for many people, um, that is contributing to losing or undermining that community. And my concern is, given other pressures in society, can that be reconstructed? So um, I, um, I don't know. I will give you another example, which is if you look at this recent secularization, the previous great impetus for this was the economic crash of 2008. And that had an enormous impact. The 2020 crash is probably going to be bigger. Um, and that meant, for instance, what? Uh, people were unable to set up homes and families, uh, start family formation, uh, have these families who they take along to church. 2008 marks a dramatic decline in American religiosity and institutional behavior. If the same thing happens in 2020 uh, over and above that, then that's, that's a worrying prospect. Yeah. yeah, you talk about the rapidity with which this can happen. You draw an interesting parallel um, or you know, draw on a, a case study of, of Quebec in Canada. Uh, maybe you'd like to say something about, about that. Uh, Quebec is uh, a, a fascinating example of a, an ultra-religious society becoming a secular society in an extremely short time. In the 1960s, they had their famous uh, Quiet Revolution. Up until the 1960s, Quebec was famous as being one of the most religious societies in the world. It had this ultra-ultra-conservative Catholic church. You know, the, um, the popes who were very conservative at the time used to lecture them on not being so extremely conservative and reactionary. Um, just in the space of the mid 1960s, uh, you, you had a new change in political consciousness. Um, people became much more uh, educated, much more outspoken, much more radical on so many issues. 
and the religion of Quebec um, basically, I don't say disappeared, but declined very rapidly. Uh, in modern times, if you go to Catholic churches in the province of Quebec, uh, the ones that are open are often flourishing, but they're flourishing with immigrants from uh, Haiti, uh, Africa, Vietnam. So these are, you know, very, very good and very passionate Catholics, but it's a very different population from what was there before. Traditional French Quebecois uh, Catholics are very unlikely to be uh, seen there. That's a religious revolution in the space of a decade or two. And I draw your attention again to the fact of the new immigrants being much more religious. And in that case, supporting and reviving the old uh, religion. And we often see that in, um, in Europe uh, also. Uh, there are so many old Anglican churches, for example, in Britain, um, which are homes to many uh, devout uh, people, uh, newer immigrant communities. Britain's Catholic churches would be in great trouble without uh, Polish immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a couple of questions that have come in and uh, very happy to put these to you, um, Philip. So one is from Kim, uh, Kim Bolt, I believe, and uh, Karen, Karen Bolt, actually. Um, how is the dynamic growth of Christianity in China to be explained in light of the enforced low fertility rate within that society? Mm. What are the dynamics there? So, you know, here's a, a society which has been told um, you can only have one child, you know, forced. And yet we seem to be seeing, certainly from a Christian point of view, um, something of a kind of religious Christian uh, awakening uh, in China at the same time. How do these things work? Yeah. Uh, in my book, uh, I mentioned that I have a real problem with China, not because it runs against my argument, but because it's so hard to get reliable data. Um, the actual numbers for Christians and Christian growth are a complete mess. Uh, the best bet for the number of Christians in China is round about 70 million, um, which is, you know, it's a very large number, but it means that the rate of growth has declined very sharply in, um, in recent years. And the same is true of, um, of other uh, religions. I think what happened is that there was a religious revival in the late 20th century due to the um, desperate need of people, the collapse of older uh, ideologies, and that set off uh, a revival, which I think lasted for a generation. I don't know how much longer it can, um, it can continue and uh, how far it can continue without the, uh, the generation of, um, of young people, by the way. China is another country that is going to have to think very hard uh, about whether it can survive uh, without substantial uh, immigration. And so it might be that, it, you know, come back in 20 years and the flourishing churches in China will be African migrants. And we're already seeing something uh, like that right now. Uh, but, but, but China is a, is a very difficult one to study because the data are so hard to get. Yeah. Then we have another question from from Josh, uh, Josh Wilhelm, who asks about this in relation to climate change, actually. Yep. In his latest film, David Attenborough highlights the negative climate effects of a rapidly growing global population on our planet. Yep. At the end of the film, he suggests that we humans need to reach a peak population number as quickly as possible to reduce these negative effects on the climate. How much fertility is too much for our planet? So that's, just, that's a, you know, obviously a kind of a, a broader question, yeah. but um, yeah, what do you make of that? <laughs> I'm trying to frame my answer there because basically we've just got onto the issue of my next book very seriously. Uh, uh -huh. And one of the uh, issues is that the people in the world who are most likely to be hit by climate change are people who did least to cause it um, because they tend to be countries in uh, Africa and Asia, very poor countries, and also very high fertility countries. Um, and these are going to be the, the victims of the worst uh, climate change. You have tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people who, uh, in those countries who will become climate refugees and will be knocking on Europe's 
door uh, with all the religious implications of that. These are people who are very going to be very uh, open to apocalyptic teachings about this, um, uh, this new world. Um, I saw the Attenborough program. It was, uh, it was very impressive indeed. Um, and I, th there's uh, uh, no doubt that if we could move to a lower fertility society, a smaller population in the long run, that would be wonderful. But we need to think very carefully of what the middle ground is. How would we cope with a society with a median age of 50 or 60? Just suppose we lived in a world where there weren't all these young communities around the world to bring in to do the jobs and pay the taxes. Could our societies uh, survive? Uh, you know, you may remember P.D. James's uh, book, uh, Children of Men, and the film uh, growing out of that. Um, a society without young people would be a nightmare. The problem is, would it even be possible? So uh, I, I, I'm still wrestling with the David Attenborough uh, film. He asks uh, key questions. But my, I suppose my, my, prob my comment would be, if you want, be careful what you wish for, you might just get it. Uh, a very low fertility, low population world has a lot of disadvantages of its own. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. So this is, the, this is your next book. And... Um... Yeah, oh, maybe we can talk about that in a few months' time. Good. Whenever, when, when is this coming out, Philip? Um, March. Okay, right. Okay, so it's, it's, is it done? Oh, yeah. And it, it will bear the title Climate, Catastrophe and Faith. Okay, right. Okay, fascinating stuff. Well, we can see that this affects so many different um, different areas of our concerns as a... Uh, as 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 people, particularly but particularly as people who are interested in in religion, and so, um, are there any solutions to this? I mean, because one can see there are benefits to living in a low fertility society or lower fertility society. There's certainly benefits there, and certainly benefits of living in in modern cultures where we do have access to healthcare and all of those kind of things and high quality. And yet we can see the downside too. I mean, are there, are there any solutions here that are not solutions that um, for religious people that basically either demand that we kind of um, just go along with the zeitgeist on all kinds of stuff um, uh, and, 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 and don't want to belong to institutions. Um, become much more in individualistic or on the other hand to kind of to basically turn our back on the progress that women have made in terms of education and and and, and employment and so on um in in the modern world which is extraordinary um right. i mean I, personally i wouldn't want to go down that route but it, it it seems that that is part of the central issue in some of these culture wars See, what I'm suggesting is that religious institutions of all kinds have to decide what the most important thing is for them. What is the heart of the matter? Uh, is it keeping up particular kinds of uh, institution and hierarchy and so on? Um, you know, for instance, for many years, our churches generally assumed a society that was a rural agricultural peasant society, which it hasn't been for hundreds of years in the West. Um, I'll give you a very specific example. Um, suppose you want to reach out to people and evangelize people, and you think of doing it in terms of uh, the the, uh, the families uh, your kids go to school with. Well, assume you don't have kids. Uh, the people in your workplace. Well, assume you don't go to a workplace. You work from home. How do you do it? And I look at some of the innovative uh, evangelistic methods of something like the Alpha Course uh, in Great Britain which is based on a networking system for people you know fairly casually. You haven't worked with them in the same office for 15 years because people don't do that anymore. Um, it assumes a world more of isolated individuals or maybe couples. It has been phenomenally uh, successful. Uh, there's a famous quote about it, which is a uh, Catholic cardinal said it was the greatest gift of Protestantism to the Catholic Church since the Pentecostal movement. 
and you can imagine saying that with a, well, discuss uh, after it. Um, but what that is, is it's an innovative, creative solution to a new kind of society um, that uh, does not begin to say, now, you know, women have to get back to their, their, their own social world. Of course not. Um, any kind of religious formation which does not take full account of that change in women's roles, for example, um, is doomed. Exactly how they do it is up for discussion, uh, but that has to be uh, uh, front, uh, front and center. And if you've ever wondered, uh, dealing with questions like that is why God gave us theologians. This is what they are meant to be uh, thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, well, I mean, the, you know, it, it's just so uh, fascinating to kind of consider uh, these issues. Um, you used the, 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 or could have pushed back a little bit earlier on uh, the, the D word, the determinism word, um, which I'm sure that you you push back on academically um, and, you know, in terms of your kind of, um, you know, your work as a historian and as a sociologist, but probably as a Christian as well, one wants to push back against this kind of notion of, of determinism and there's nothing, uh, there's nothing cut and dried about anything, uh, consequences, the necessary consequences of any of these uh, developments. Um, You've pointed to uh, something that, you know, that there are some developments that are very positive. Where else do you see um, ways in which religious people, Christian people who want to be engaging well with the modern world? Um, how, how do you see us um, being able to kind of live in a way that both takes these, uh, these dynamics seriously but that also wants to kind of keep the rumor of God alive, if you like. Yeah, I come back to this idea of thinking very hard about, uh, you know, so so what, what is what is the heart of the matter? What what is the uh, what, what what is the core of what uh, people are, are are trying to do? Um, I think it really helps uh, to pay serious attention to history, to look at the different ways in which church has been church in different centuries and different uh, uh, societies. Uh, we, do, we should not assume that there are certain things that we absolutely have to uh, uh, cling on to uh, here. Uh, do not cling on to the idea of the manifestations that we find in the West as the only um, uh, manifestations. Um, recognize that uh, uh, Christianity presently, in terms of its its uh, global shifts, is going through a transition which is probably on a par with the Reformation in terms of the long stretch of uh, Christian um, history. And that's just ge very general uh, comments, but maybe it's a lesson about uh, about humility, um, uh, 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 about assuming what we can absolutely um, uh, absolutely rely on. Uh, 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 Christians rely on the Bible, but there are a great many different ways of reading the Bible, and the uh, rising churches in Africa and Asia are reading them in such exciting and innovative ways, which often recreate the lessons of the early Christian centuries. I think for Christians in the United States or Canada or Britain, uh, there, there are a lot of lessons to be uh, uh, to be learned there. So it's as, you know, humility and learning. There are a couple of uh, new principles. You wrote um, quite an influential book some time ago called The Next Christendom, which tracks the, the kind of center of gravity, the shift of the center of gravity in global Christianity mm -hmm. to the global south, as it is some, sometimes called. And I wonder if any of them, I mean, that's, that's going back a few years now, but I wonder if any of the research that you've done for this book has changed your thinking at all about any of the, um, the kind of uh, argument that you came up with in that. Yeah, um, the, the most important change is not so much a change in my thinking as the realities I was observing. So, for example, back in 2002, when I wrote that book, I was writing about a global south that was about Africa, Asia, Latin America. Okay, if you look at the changes I'm talking about here in terms of fertility and faith, there isn't a global south. There is Africa which is extremely high fertility and extremely high faith. And that's exactly everything I said way back when. 
But if you look like Latin America, it looks like Denmark. It looks much more uh, uh, European. Uh, much of the continent is low faith, uh, low, low fertility, uh, large proportions of nuns in uh, many uh, uh, in many countries, and that European change, that European revolution, is spreading over much of the continent. Asia, well, of course, Asia is extremely complex. But if you want to see the lowest fertility rates in the, uh, the world, uh, you go to Southeast Asia. You, you go to countries like Taiwan, you go to uh, South Korea in uh, East Asia, and you look at uh, countries where a decline in faith is not just faith in Christianity, but Buddhism. Buddhism is a faith in deep crisis because it's associated with all these extremely low fertility uh, societies. And that's probably the biggest change. I wrote about the Global South. The Global South to that extent does not exist anymore. There's Africa, which is the future of Christianity and the future of Islam. And then there's Asia and um, La uh, Latin America. Quick, quick figure. In uh, 1900, there were 10 million Christians on the continent of Africa. By 2050, there'll be 1 billion Christians on the continent of Africa. And that does not account uh, for people in the African diaspora in places like Canada and Wales and other countries. That's a phenomenal change. It is definitive for Christianity. You and I uh, grew up not far from each other, really, in, uh, in, in South Wales, which at that time was a very, a very religious society, really. How do you reflect on your own journey, um, and, you know, and, and what you've seen, witnessed um, about you know what's happening uh how do you reflect on that from a kind of personal point of view as a as a as both a, an academic and, and as a believer mm. wales is very interesting you know uh, uh, a little over 100 years ago wales was legendary as you say as a great center of uh center of faith you know you had the great welsh revival which was a great uh, transformative event wales is one of the most secular countries in the world right now uh, i mean there certainly are you know believers but they're a um, a tiny uh minority um, it's been so fascinating for me spending time in a place like Texas, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dallas or Waco vie for the title of being the buckle on the Bible belt. Uh, very, very religious uh, places. I teach at a Baptist uh, uh, university. And I, I sort of, I look a little nervously, a little interrogatively, uh, wondering will we see the same sort of changes there uh, in my in my lifetime, will it Europeanize in that um, in that way? Um, and uh, the answer is I don't know, and I, I, I suspect not in uh, uh, not in a hurry, um, uh, because uh, America's great strength is it is such a great immigrant nation, and it has these constant new waves of migrants who tend to be very very religious uh, people. Um, so. Um, as I said, that British experience, as you suggest, is very much at the, uh, at the back of my uh, mind as I, um, I observe this. Um, and I, by the way, I'm also very grateful for my British Welsh background in one way, because I had an old style education which taught me about the importance of areas in Africa and Asia, albeit as part of the British Empire. That's very unfashionable now, but it, it taught me the importance of those areas and how you couldn't talk about the world unless you paid full attention to India, to uh, Africa. So I'm very grateful for that. Although, of course, I'm seeing those through a totally different lens. Mm. You end uh, your book with a kind of reflection on a wonderful poem by Philip Larkin yeah. called Church Going. Um, I wonder if you could just talk say something about that as we end this uh, conversation because it it does seem a kind of an interesting place to end i think anyone interested in uh, secularization or the present state of religion in the west could uh, uh, do much worse than to read philip larkin's uh, church going um which you can find anywhere uh, online tells a story about a uh, man going uh, down a, a country road he goes into an old uh, church uh, which is deserted and he speculates, okay, I don't believe in any of this stuff. Many of the people around me don't believe in any of this stuff. What will it be like when that church has 
gone, when religion has gone. There'll be a couple of years maybe when it'll be a sense of superstition, but then when it goes, and then ultimately he says, no, it can't, it can't ultimately, because the search for something, for a, um, a serious place on serious ground it is, will always bring, uh, bring us back, uh, because there's a world with so many dead around, and we have to speak to those, those dead, that tradition, the, the whole world that uh, made us. And um, it, in a sense, even if religion in an institutional, traditional sense fails, then religion more broadly will never uh, go. And so um, I, I think that is worth more than, you know, 50 academic or quantitative studies of the state of religion. So I, I, I really strongly recommend that. Great. Well, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Thank you to, to Philip. Thank you to our uh, uh, viewers for um, being part of this, too. Uh, it's a really fascinating book as I maybe fascinating I've used that word too many times in this conversation but it really is Philip Jenkins fertility and faith the demographic revolution and the transformation of world religions Baylor uh, University Press uh, thank you for joining us we'll have more of these conversations in the future but uh, goodbye for now <laughs>